Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us again, Fading Memories listeners. I so appreciate that you choose our podcast for your listening pleasure. With me today is David Bernstein. I almost butchered it, caught myself. And we are going to be talking about driving dilemmas and what we might be able to do to help our senior population be safer behind the wheel or maybe give up the car keys. So thank you very much, David, for joining me today. It's my pleasure to be with you today, Jennifer. Thank you for inviting me to talk about what is a subject that's near and dear to my heart and one that needs to be discussed. Definitely. And so why don't you give us your background? Because it's very interesting. I grew up on Long Island in New York at an early age, decided I wanted to be a doctor, maybe influenced by my immigrant father, World War II wounded veteran, and my mother, who they loved their doctor. Um, When I was 17, I saw a National Geographic magazine cover about a centenarian. And I said, what is that? Who are those people? I want to do that when I get older. So went to medical school and became a geriatrician. Somewhere in there, also, I met a man who graduated from my high school 10 years before me, who was an author. I followed his career and I said, I want to do that too. (laughs) <laughs> so that's how I went through my career uh, as a geriatrician for 40 years. Um, I was always collecting stories in my head about things and people. And um, when I had time starting about 10, 15 years ago, I started putting them together and um, um, came up with the first of my four books. It, it's interesting because we're talking about driving today. Um, The initial title of my book was going to be the response I got from my patients when I challenged them about their driving. And so in my sense of humor, it would be, quote, but doctor, I'm a good driver, end quote, because that's what my challenged patients would say. And I would hear it over and over again, and I would cringe if I looked in the parking lot at their car or watched them drive or watched, I, I always watched them walk. I, if I even gave it some thought about what medicines they were on, I'd, I'd just get crazed. But um, I, it, it was a subject that came up often enough. I thought it was, it addressed some of the unmet needs in the community, addressing driving, which was all about me because I always wanted to address unmet needs. It's like being a geriatrician. Um, There aren't enough geriatricians in this country. And I wanted to do something that was for an underserved um, population. Well, I've said for quite a while, my husband was a planning commissioner in our old hometown and we've had, and he's also a, a real estate broker So we've had many discussions about how our, especially suburban communities, are not designed for an aging population, and we're going to be in very big trouble if we don't figure out how to fix some of these things. Like, I'm from California, and I could walk to the grocery store, but I wouldn't want to carry all the groceries home, or I guess I could put them in a wagon, but... You know, I don't, I'm 55. I don't want to do that now. I certainly don't want to do it at 75, you know, so, but I have to take my card. It's like less than two miles. I think it's about a mile and a quarter. That Yeah, that sounds about right. But it's like, I got to take my car a mile to get to the grocery store. Just seems dumb. You know, there's, there's got to be better ways. We have talked about getting delivery in the household, but somebody resists. It's not me. You know, just... We definitely don't have the infrastructure for people not to drive. So there's our first problem, which obviously a geriatrician can't fix. But what did you come up with as what? Where where do you go when you know one of your patients is not driving well, but doesn't admit it? Well, you've given me a handful of things to talk about. I'm so delighted. (laughs) Um, Maybe I can start with. 
autonomous driving cars. If you're if you're a youngster at 55, <laughs> autonomous cars will be available by the time you're 65 or 70. So that may be one solution uh, to that. But it's not a solution to my patients who are 86 and shouldn't be driving for uh, a whole host of reasons. Second is I'll address um, Mr. Jennifer, your husband, <laughs> and, and 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 let him know that I was away for with my wife for three weeks and we got my wife left me alone for three or four days before I she left before me. So uh, there was no food in the house when we returned home. Um, but on her way home from the airport, she put in an order for pickup and I picked it up. Um, OK, so I drove, but it could have been delivered um, to our home. And boy, that was nice and easy. I didn't have to, at least I didn't have to shop. Um, so so there will be those options. And uh, even my wife commented, other than them leaving out the bananas, um, it really was it was really a nice situation. Um, so did they it, pick it, good produce? Yeah, the pro and my wife is really picky about things like that. Um, I don't know that she would let anybody pick her eggplants because her eggplant dishes require the very best, sweetest eggplants, and she knows how to pick them. Yeah, like me, she knows how to pick me. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one because that's the complaint that I hear. It's like well, I don't want other people picking out my, you know, my produce, and it's like it's their job to make you happy, so they're not going to pick the yucky produce, which pretty much don't see in the grocery store because we throw that away before it's even, you know, past it, totally past its prime. You know, obviously, well, it's interesting. you know, it, it, they might forget something. Oops, we're having a Zoom, yeah. <laughs> Zoom lag. <laughs> Go ahead. But it's but it's interesting you say that because it's just a weak excuse. Just I agree. Like, just like the weak excuses that people would give me for continuing to drive. I don't like my wife's driving. She doesn't drive very well. Um, I'm a better driver than she is. Her neck is bad. Well, your neck is bad. Her vision's <laughs> bad. I mean, you know, they, I would hear all kinds of rationalizations for people who would put themselves in harm's way. And I would, when my, my children are now in their 30s, but when they were in their three, four, five, six, seven year range, um, I would think about it would be an afternoon. I know they'd be on their way home from school. And then I know that that man was driving his car while my kids were on the roads getting home. Yikes. And I would think, wow, that's an accident waiting to happen. And so um, I would use lots of my tricks of the trade to address it. So Jennifer, as an example, two of my maybe three, two of my favorite uh, fictional characters are Inspector Clouseau, who would say, suspect everyone, trust no one. And Columbo, who would say, uh, just one more thing. And Monk <laughs> was another one of my favorites. But I would ask questions over and over again and try and tease out, you know, exactly where were they going, where they were going and what they were doing and how necessary was it for them to be on the road. And, and I have to admit, even after I published my, my book, Senior Driving Dilemmas, I, um, I softened my take on this a little bit and said, well, you know what? It's only right turns to go to the hairstylist. I think she can go the three quarters of a mile there and three quarters of a mile home. And, and sometimes these were people who started to have cognitive decline. It's like, I think she can get there. She's told me she could. She's done it for 20 years. She's just gone to the bank and back. Um, but I did have patients who couldn't tell me the roads they were on to get to Bob Evans or Cracker Barrel. It's like, which Cracker Barrel did you go to? Because I think you had to go across a causeway to get to that one. That's pretty far. Um, and the same person couldn't tell me what medicines he was taking. And he would he would give me a piece of paper like this big. And, as, note. <laughs> you know, but like two by two inch piece of paper with his in, his medications listed on there. And in, um, in 2010, and I'd say, but it says 2008. I've changed your medicine since then. Like, what medicine are you taking? I said, I, I, I'm calling in these prescriptions. And I, I, I stopped that one a long time ago. Like, 
they were he and his wife were just so confused the, the two of them this is one in particular um uh, that were love lovely couple i took care of them for a long period of time but but they were both so confused and they supported one another in in their hijinks because they didn't want their son in north carolina to know what was going on but their community of friends knew and inspector so interrogated their their community of friends so i knew from that and I would never give away my source of, of of information, but I confronted them many occasions, and 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 it was a frustration. They never did quit. They never did go to another doctor. So I did have a chance to take care of them, and eventually got the son to move them to North Carolina. It was not easy. That no, was sure. it's it sticks with me. And, and then I'll, I'm going to tell you this story because I didn't even include it in anything I've written because it. It happened afterwards, but there was a man who was a new patient of mine. He had moved down from New York, Queens, within New York City. I knew the area because my father and I would drive on that road to get into Manhattan. I knew what the buildings were like. I knew what the roads were like there. And uh, he had been living in the same building for like 40 years, maybe longer. He was in his 80s. And suddenly he moved into a high rise condo on Clearwater Beach. And the skeptic in me said, like, why did you do move? Well, you know, I just wanted to come down and I have a nephew who lives, you know, like 30 miles away. Went, but he's not coming to visit you. You never even had a relationship with him. I badgered him for the 45 minutes or an hour during the, the visit of both taking history and, and his physical exam. And he was a bit frail. And um, toward the end, he said, well, you know, Doc, I'm going to tell you what happened. And he said, I was parking my car. Again, I know about where he's parking his car. And he said, the next thing I knew, my car went through the window of the cleaners, which means he jumped the curb, jumped the sidewalk and was in. And and he, you know, there was blah, 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 blah. And I heard the word craniotomy, uh -oh. which, which is a bad thing to happen if you need one. And it means they they open up your skull to relieve the pressure because that's what happened to the victim of this accident. Ooh, so he yikes. basically destroyed a person's life because he was too stubborn to give up his car. And because he didn't want to lose the assets he had attained, he moved to a different state oh, just that's... to live all by himself because Oof. he was, he was too hard headed, not only to give up his car, but he lived on a street where there was public transportation for 40 years. It was public New transportation. York city. You think about New York, you got buses and cat taxis and subways. Right I mean, there. Yeah. Right there. I mean, New York, my husband is from Staten Island. And that explains he, it. <laughs> and, you know, so it's like when we when he compares New York City and their transportation, like out here, we have like, I swear, every little burb and county and everything, you know, there's, we don't have, just San Francisco's got like three or four transit authority, not authorities is not what we call them, but that's what they are in New York. It's just ridiculous. You know, and it's just not, well, there's more than four. It's yeah. I can't even, I can't even, I'd have to really think about it, but yeah, there's just so many. And then in the last decade, they've started to like merge up, op not operations, but like you can buy one transit card that works on all four or five or whatever there is. That wasn't the way before. That's in San Francisco. God forbid you're out here in the suburbs. Take you three hours to get someplace on a bus. So I can't imagine. Oh, this guy must have. Been, maybe I'm related to this guy because my family is super stubborn. Um, I just um, can't these, imagine these these people. They're they're a stubborn group, and and then there's the family. Oh, this is my favorite line, but. They would rather talk about selling a home or funeral plans than talking about taking away the keys. And um, I have my expression that I'd say to the family members is you have to beg, borrow and steal to get them to give up their their license. And, you know, you have to go at it with a plan. You have to have uh, the ability to retreat and then go back in and and ultimately you know, get them to relinquish their keys 
And, you know, you could ask, as, as I offered, ask the doctor to participate in the process, because I'm sure there are listeners to this program who who have a parent like this. And and um, if they just alert a doctor that there's a problem, because the doctors generally don't go out and look in the parking lot unless they're interested like me and they don't hear from neighbors. So unless they're like me, um, then they, they don't know. But if you can notify them, they can notify the Department of Motor Vehicles and and get an assessment underway. And and that's kind of the tricky stuff that I did. It's, you know, I established that someone reports them anonymously it was me they would bring a piece of paper to me to sign. I go, but I don't know how well you drive. Let's have a driver evaluation done. And, and I'd send them down to the occupational therapy department at a hospital. And in, in our neighborhood, there's a program that they run called Drive Able. And it's a computerized, validated assessment of how well someone would do on an on-road test. And it sounds and safer. It's, it, it, it's kind of, yeah. Well, I, I did have, I did include in my first book the entire driver evaluation that was done on road. And it was scary, funny, but scary. <laughs> uh, but they, there's a validated test. And, I, and I'd make an agreement with my patients. They never accepted after the fact. But I'd say, if you don't pass, then you'll give up your driving. Oh, yes, doctor. Sure. And and this validated test, I mean, you know, you put an 86-year-old person on a computer, um, they're not going to do well, but it's where they move their hands and how they manage certain questions that I get responses like a 98% chance they would fail an on-road test. And so that was strong enough for me to say, uh, 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 you're not driving. Let's take this to the next step. Your wife will drive or you give up your keys and you move to retirement communities. And and um, there were success stories, too. Um, I had one of my favorite patients whose name was Jane. And she can't, I would talk to her um, periodically about giving up her keys. And she said, I decided to do it, Doc. I'm moving to this retirement community. I don't need to be there. It's going to be like a place for me to store my clothes, but I'm going to go to my sweet Adeline's and, and I'm going to do my clubs and all that. And I'm going to take Ubers wherever I want to go. And so she gave her her keys. Another lady, there were three in, in this. I did a TV interview. Um, and one was a woman who said, I'd stop driving when I'm 95. I promise you, doc. <laughs> well, she she didn't give it up till 98 but oh she, she did and she didn't have she didn't have an accident i got invited i sat next to her at her 100th birthday party so um she didn't hate me for t- getting her to stop driving i think she liked it and the other person in that in that news um interview was my mother-in-law who uh had an abrupt discontinuation of her driving privileges when she got in an accident Mm. told her car, didn't have money for another car, and she wasn't going to get another car. It was a fourth accident. She blamed the Ooh. other person, and nobody got – she she had a fractured pelvis. Um, that was 12 or 15 years ago at age 97. She's still alive and, and driving us crazy. But <laughs> um, we got her off the road by hook or by crook. And then – so there are a lot of different ways in which people can do it, I, I think – for um are your parents still with you no my mom passed away from alzheimer's in march 2020 and my dad had renal failure in march of 2017 oh. march not such so, not such a great month <laughs> well, my birthday month but i understand uh, there you so, go that's you know, a good, you, good you, thing you, you you begin the conversation early they, you know, and when when you're in your 50s and they're in their 60s or when you're in your 40s and they're in their 60s, uh, hey, mom, you know, dad, are you going to stay in this house forever? Because, you know, you may get older and you may like the house. And why don't you have a 10 year plan, which is what my wife and I do, although she says we have a 10 year plan. We just evaluated it six months ago and we'll do it again in six months. But um, we you know, we make sure our home is um 
it's friendly for people as they age. We want to age in place. We redid our kitchen. We've redone everything, but we redid our kitchen and, and it's very comfortable and, and, and we make it so it's as, as safe as possible. But, you know, make sure that there's a thought process going on here. Mom, yet and dad, you don't live close enough to a grocery store. This is this is just not going to work. And, you know, let's spend the next two, three, four years uh, evaluating retirement communities where you can get your food and you don't have to drive and sooner or later you give up your keys. And it could be done in a more peaceful way rather than getting someone who's very stuck in their ways and they have dementia and they don't trust anybody. And um, and then it becomes impossible. And then, you know, you're resentful as a child um, that you've had to do something so onerous. And, you know, you probably went through that, Jennifer, yourself. I did a little bit with my dad. So, like... September 2016, he'd had an eye surgery, for which I'm not entirely certain what they were doing. And so he couldn't drive for a while, and he, they lived 20 miles away from me, so it wasn't practical to help them whatsoever. Thankfully, my dad was a Rotarian, so he had a lot of friends. He also volunteered with the Salvation Army, so there were a lot of people that could, you know, schlep them around. And it was temporary, so that wasn't too, you know, hard to deal with. Well, their doctors were literally down the hill from my house, like two miles, if that. And he came, they, you know, after their doctor's appointment, you know, we were going to go out to lunch and he's literally driving out of my neighborhood down the middle of the street in this, thank God we were in the neighborhood. I'm like, let's go to this particular restaurant that happened to be on the edge of the neighborhood, just also on the main road, but I didn't have to get him on the main road. I was terrified and I thought, you know, what in the hell am I going to do? Like their doctors are over here and maybe he's just recuperating from the ice. I mean, it was like I had 5,000 thoughts going through my head, but it was like one of the major ones was I'm never getting in the car with him again. That was terrifying. You know, I like roller coasters, but I was not, I was not really feeling good that day. You know, and he was taking care of my mom. Well, so that was September of 2016, maybe October, the end of November, he ended up in the hospital and then he ended up home on hospice. So I, I didn't have to pull any triggers. <clears throat> he did come home from the hospital and we had moved his car because he, um, he needed to go back on dialysis and he didn't want to, which was fine. I knew that I accepted that he just hadn't told anybody that we were at that stage. So that was a problem. So the toxins from the failing transplanted kidney <laughs> was it basically caused his caused him to have memory loss. Now I've looked back and I realized that there was some serious warning signs before that happened, but of course, you know, hindsight is 2020. So there was a brief moment when he knew he had a gap in his memory and he was really adamant that he wanted to prove that he could still drive well. And I'm like, and that is why your car is in front of my house 20 miles away. I'm not even giving you the opportunity to prove you can still drive. <laughs> Yikes, that was scary. And then it was only a matter of days before he didn't even remember that he was having memory issues. So I didn't have to deal with that. But so I, I dodged most of those bullets, but we did have my husband and I are also Rotarians. And there was a gentleman in our club who really, really needed to stop driving. And we ended up like behind him on a, not really a side road, but not a main road. And he's driving with the wheels on the, on the edge and he's driving really slow. And of course this is California, you know, the speed limit signs are not a limit. It's just a sort of suggestion as to where to start. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying I drive that way, but <laughs> You know, it's and it's so, so much worse post pandemic too. people are just insane. They drive like they're flying a rocket, which is a good way to maybe convince your older family members. They probably don't want to get up on the road because blame it on the crazy people. But yeah, he was all over the road and, it, and my husband knew his his children. And so we called them and said, you know, yeah, dad's having some serious problems. You might want to deal with it. I don't know what they did, if they did anything. Um, he finally did total the car. That so it was kind of like the gal that you were talking about didn't didn't have an option. So, but it, it's really scary because you're like, we need to do something about this, but what can we do? So that's why we're having this conversation. So you talked about 
easing into it, but what what should we attempt to do if we can't ease into it? You know, it's like all of a sudden we realize that, you know, the dents on mom's car are because she's hitting things, not because people are hitting her. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement, and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I think you try try and be rational about it. You have some family meetings and you know if you want to call them like interventions, you have an intervention and um you keep nibbling away at it. Hopefully, you've developed good rapport with your um, your your loved one, and um, you can explain to them some of the things. Um, sometimes they're just they get, as my mother would say, as people get older, they become more what they were. If they were stubborn, they become more stubborn. <laughs> oh boy, um, I'm in trouble. <laughs> And, 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 yeah, sorry, but truth. Um, the 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 one thing that um, that one patient responded to was the financial aspect of it. The one who moved to retirement community, her son, who is also a patient, and I took care of her husband when he was alive, um, made a rational decision. It was well, the the carrying costs of a car are a thousand dollars a month whether you lease it or whether you made payments. I mean, you could lie about it, but it's about $1,000. And gasoline prices, well, in California, you know what that is. And insurance for an 80-something-year-old, and that's expensive too. And before you know it, you say, well, this is what you're spending a month. And if you move in retirement community and they provide transportation, you don't have that. Or if we just help you with Ubers and Lyfts, and work on some carpool arrangements, this is going to be a much safer situation. And, and, and lastly, um, you know, in, in your um, podcast about fading memories, um, and for me being a geriatrician and what I read, is there's going to be a tremendous um, exchange of wealth over the next 20 or 30 years as people, baby boomers die and tra- and, and they, their children inherit their assets. And so you can go at it from, you know, you're going to lose those assets. And I know you promised those assets to me or your grandchildren, and you're going to blow them because you're going to end up in a hospital or a nursing home and you're going to have to pay for it. And you may get sued because you shouldn't have been driving and it was at night and, and, you know, whatever, you know, the, the fact is that as people get older, the number of accidents per mile goes up and fatality rates go up after 75, even though older people wear seatbelts and they have take more care. They just don't have the skills to drive. And so it's, using any one of a whole bunch of things to get through. It's the financial one, it's the medical one, are you relying on a doctor or occupational therapist to, to do an evaluation? Look, you know, you can even ask a pharmacist, um, is it safe for dad to drive? He's, 
<laughs> you know, I, I, I know when I look back at some of my patients who were driving and they were on sentinel patches and hydrocodone. And um, one of the really bad things that older adults do is they, they take something to help them sleep like Benadryl. Well, Benadryl has a really negative effect on your memory. It has the opposite effect of mem medicines that would enhance your memory. And it makes you sedated and it has a hangover period. And, you know, mix that with a little bit of Xanax at night because you got a little and you had a bad day and you go out to the grocery store in the morning. And not only do you have a fender bender, but then you don't even know where you are because, you know, things are all tensed up. So it's, you know, you might, my point about that was in, in, involve a, a pharmacist to look at medications and say, you know, these medicines are really important for you, but maybe based on this and you keep taking these, but you can't drive anymore. And we don't want you to go off these pills. You might have to make up a little bit of a story, but, you know, there's, there's a team approach to doing all this. And then there's, you know, the four letter word of love. Mom, Dad, we love you, and 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 this is but you know, Mom, Dad, we love you, and, and we we you want to see your grandson graduate from high school or college, and it's just two years away, and you know we're concerned that you'll be injured in a car, or you're con we're concerned that you might be driving in a in a parking lot and hit one of their friends who's, you know, out on the curb, you know, going in to get their haircut and going into the grocery store. And, and just think about how, how awful that would be for you to spend the rest of your life uh, regretting this decision that, that could have been avoided. So um, that's kind of my approach to that. That's my big borrow and steal. Do everything. And, and by the, and by the way, I, I, I want to comment on you. You said your husband volunteers for the Salvation Army. That was my dad, um, but oh, your dad. Um, they're my best patients. The retired Salvation Army officers were my dream come true. They did, except for the guy who continued to drive. Um, <laughs> but but they all loved one another in their community. These were the retired officers um, that they would support one another and talk about these two people who were still driving and that they shouldn't, and I should do something about it, you know? So I had my informants. That's what, you know, a good detective does. They have their informants. So um, th that's the, the, the key to that. Um, I think, you know, I know it, it, it gets to be kind of late in life, but there are some things a person can do to make themselves more resistant to those problems, you know, the, the things that I recommend that people eat right and exercise, particularly strength training for your legs so that you can get in and out of your car and nobody will question your, your situation and you eat well so that, you know, you're, you're, you're not overdoing sugar because sugar is bad for your brain and, and, and that you get enough sleep and that you're working on getting enough sleep. Um, I'd like to say that people should meditate. Yes, I do say that people should meditate and, and be mindful. It, it's hard to talk to a 75 or 80 year old person about suddenly learning mindfulness. And, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and, 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 a, and a big problem, you know, I, I talk about because you and I are from the same generation, I included sex in my five S's. If you notice, they all began with the letter S. But sex, sex is also about socialization, and it's about connection with other people, and it's about uh, intimacy. And the opposite of intimacy is loneliness. And so, you know, we have to make sure that when we address these issues, we make sure that there's enough socialization in the environment. And some of that socialization will be, yeah, we're going to the senior citizen center. Why don't you come? Or there's, there's going to be a, a square dancer. There's going to be, um, um, I know you like to play chess or I know you like to do pottery. We're going to be doing some pottery today. That would be really good. Why don't you join our club and, and, and do that? So you, you, you deal with the loneliness as a problem for some of these people and engage them and, and, and bring them along in, 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 the, um, in terms of providing them transportation. So that's just a, a whole bunch of different things that people can try. But as you recognize, you're dealing with a person who gets very set in their ways later in life. And so addressing it early and having that discussion, you know, even for you and your husband to have the discussion tonight and say, you know what, 
we're we're in our fifties, but this is going to happen. You know, let's uh, have a pact between us that we're going to respond uh, to people in a favorable way when they tell us that we shouldn't be driving, or we're going to move into an environment or plan to move into an environment that's going to be conducive to that. Well, we kind of well we've had those conversations because when we were in the market for this house that we moved into, the end of twenty. 21, like the last couple of years, <laughs> they all blended together because they were so exciting. You know, we, we, he, even though he's a real estate broker, we used a broker because we were two hours from our old hometown. And he, my husband said, this is our last house until we die or have to move into assisted living. And I was like, yay, I've at least convinced one person, the most pro- important person in my life, because I, I tell people like, you get to be 85. You're retired, right? So why you've worked hard all your life, you've raised family, maybe you've taken care of yourself and your home. And, you know, that's a lot of work. So why would you want to do the cooking, the cleaning or and, you know, manage maybe housekeeping staff, not staff, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm not that rich, um, you know, housekeeping company, a landscaping company and, you know, take the trash out to the curb because, you know, my husband was gone for, you know, a week before I flew in and met him. And it was like, there's a lot of stupid nitpicky stuff that you got to remember to take care of because somebody else is taking care of it. It's like, why? Why would you want to do that? You, Why don't you want to just go someplace where all that stuff is taken care of? Somebody's doing the cooking, they're planning activities, and you can just decide when you get up what you feel like doing. Like, to me, that sounds great. You know, I'm not quite ready for it yet, but the community we moved into originally was a very large vacation rental home community. And then for a while it was a retirement community. And now it's just like a typical neighborhood, but we're on a lake and a golf course and there's lots of activities. Uh, Their communication about that is a little outdated, but that's, you know, we, we figured out how to work around that a little bit, but there's like people close by that we're, you know, we're getting to know and, and, kind of take care of each other. So we've kind of done that. And I know I have um, lazy eye. And so my brain thinks that I see double. So it only processes the vision one eye at a time. So I have, I could connect to my mom's visual impairment, you know, visual processing issues well, because I have similar ones. And I know it's like, I don't like to drive at night because it's very difficult for me to like suss out what 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 I'm looking at until I'm kind of close to it, and I know I know I'm gonna have to give up driving a lot sooner than a lot of people because my eyesight's just wacky, you know. It's and it's just a fact of life. And unfortunately, because I work from home, and then you know we spent two years pretty much not doing anything. It's like I got to get back. I have to like reinvigorate my driving muscle because I don't drive very much because I don't need to. <laughs> so. I either have to reinvigorate it or I have to let hubby do it all and not quite ready to let him do it all. So, but in, in all of these conversations I've had with people, I've never heard of using the financial risks or, and costs as a way of, of like one tool to help pry the car keys out of people's hands or, you know, the, um, or using the pharmacist. Like you would have thought I would have heard about that by now. It's always either contact the DMV or get the doctor to write a note. That's pretty much, or, you know, pull the, um, the battery plug or there's some other part. I'm like having a brain fade on the other piece. That's it. One of those. And there's some other cables you can pull out of plugs. Um, whatever. It doesn't matter. But you know, there's basically disable the car. You know, I've heard of the, all those things, but I like your approach better because those are a little bit drastic, you know. my And my mom in, in moderate, late to late Alzheimer's remembered that my dad gave her car to my brother-in-law and she was still mad about it. <laughs> well, the very, the very first man in whom I've had to deal with this as a patient, um, I, I got him to give to stop driving for a few weeks because his vision got bad during an eye thing. And then he went back to the eye doctor and the eye doctor said, oh, you can drive. So I said, oh, I don't think so. Can I see your license? And he <laughs> handed it to me and I said, oh, thank you. And I put it in my pocket. 
And he remembered as far advanced as Alzheimer's got. He said, but Bernstein took away my driver's license. <laughs> it was the only thing he knew at the end was Bernstein took away my driver's license. It goes to a different part of the brain. But Jennifer, I also want to acknowledge that um, you do your podcast and you mm -hmm. listen to your guests and you've assimilated a lot, must have assimilated a lot of information and incorporated it into your being. And, and congratulations to you for doing that because it really makes a difference that you've comfortable in your home and the reason why you made your decision. And, you know, as patients go for me as a geriatrician, that's a dream come true, come true. Because uh, there are a lot of people who put off that decision until there's an injury and there's a crisis and um, there are too many crises in, in the life of a geriatrician or in the practice of a geriatrician. There's, there's not as much opportunity to sit back and, and see things play out and, and do really well. So it's, um, it's good that you've done that. Um, it, it's, it's a compliment to you that you're able to do that and you're smart enough to do that and, and uh, not as stubborn as you might think, although the other guy might be. But um, It took a know, little longer you, to convince him. But, you know, I think caring for my mom and, and unfortunately, for better or worse, being in Rotary, you do, that tends to be a bit of an older demographic. And so you... You kind of see secondhand some of the struggles people are going through. And, you know, if you're smart, you take a step back and go, yeah, that might be me in 15 or 20 years. And and how would I want to have it handled? And so that's, you know, that's how I dealt with my mom is like, you know, she did not want to, you know, she <laughs> famously don't want to be a burden to you girls. I'm going to live forever in my home. And it's like, hello, Opposite, yeah, well, opposite, you know, those are mutually exclusive. Yeah. And so when I, you know, moved her into memory care, you know, I knew she was, oh, she was mad at me. Ooh, it was awful. But I also knew it was the best thing for her. She had friends. She had people looking after her. They got, she got to keep her dog, which was kind of a pain in the rest, but rump for the rest of us. You know, and it just, it wasn't things that I had expected and we all have like a negative thought process of memory care and nursing homes and all that stuff. And yes, they're expensive and, and not necessarily available to everybody who needs that kind of care, which I think needs to change. But that's a whole other podcast, probably not just an episode. But I learned, you know, there are ways to have good quality of life. You just have to be willing to like take a step back and evaluate you know, like I like to cook right now. My husband's um, got an open wound on his foot. He can't, it's not supposed to be walking on it. And so I've been making dinners again and I enjoy that. But you know, there are some nights I really enjoy leftovers too. So my favorite I would not, meal, leftovers. Yeah, oh, my son-in-law hates leftovers. Makes me want to punch him. because Sometimes they taste better the next day, but it's just, sometimes you just have to ask yourself, you know, what is that? What is it I want? I don't want to be cooking, cleaning. You know, it takes an hour to vacuum this entire house. And then it takes, you know, another 30 or 40 minutes to mop the whole house. It's like, that's two hours of my day. I don't want to, I'm like, I don't want to do that. So I don't want to do that when I'm 85. You know, there's no way in heck I want to do that stuff. So you got to be, you know, like you said, you got to think about it early on so that you know, like I know because I don't have peripheral vision on both sides. I don't have any depth perception. I'm surprised I'm allowed to drive, actually, <laughs> except it's been this way my whole life. So it's normal for me. But I have to, you know, I have to know that at some point I won't be driving at night. And how am I, how are we going to handle that? What if my husband can't drive? Then we got to. So see, now we got something to talk about over dinner. <laughs> yeah, great. So where can people find this wonderful book? Because it's something we, I'm sure we all need to read. The title of my book is Senior Driving Dilemma. It's available on Amazon. Uh, it's available for purchase um, through my website as well, which is uh, powerof5life.com. And if your listeners go there and they go to powerof5.com, power of five, the number five, power of five, number five, life.com slash gift. Uh, we do have a choice of some free gifts. One is called um, uh, Notes on Living Longer, which I uh, wrote not a number of years ago. And then there are two recipe books that my wife has um, put on there for some seasonal 
holiday seasons cooking and for some healthy eating during the spring and summer. So she's got two little PDF note, um, workbooks or little um, menus and recipes that are really delicious. They've all been tried on me. I like them all. <laughs> My wife is a great cook and they're heart and brain healthy foods. So, you know, that's a, a big part of all the uh, fading memories. You want to maintain your memory by eating, eating right foods. Yep, we do so that in this household. And I'm discovering, I'm, I don't know why, and I'm not questioning it, but as I get older, I have less taste for beef and even now less taste for chicken. And my husband is fighting the vegetarian meals less. And we actually made a chicken Alfredo with the cashew Alfredo, which was mm. lovely because it wasn't so heavy and greasy feeling. Yeah. And it tasted great. Like, I yeah. was really surprised. I actually fed it to guests. So <laughs> it's like. Anytime we have guests over, they get they get a, um, well, we I recommend a Mediterranean diet. When they come to my house, they get a vegan diet, a whole food plant-based diet. And uh, if there's cheese, it's cheese that we make in the kitchen from cashews or, or some vegan cheese that we buy. But um, nobody complains. They're all very happy and they, they live, they leave very content. Um, and I try to practice what I preach. I didn't always practice what I preached, but, but since doing my research and writing my books, I, I, I really do believe that, that there's a need to be very proactive and intentional about things. I wholeheartedly agree. Well, I'm hoping that we get to do an episode with your wife soon, but I have definitely appreciated this conversation today because getting people off the road that don't, shouldn't be on the road is definitely important especially when you got the younger people driving 100 miles an hour down the freeway that's terrifying you got somebody going 55 and somebody going 100 and it's like Ugh. you know even even non-cognitively impaired people that's just a horrifying scenario and i'm surprised we haven't had more just horrifically deadly accidents i don't i guess somebody's looking out for us because yikes so i appreciate this and my pleasure the wet webisode <laughs> website is will be oh my goodness must be time for lunch my brain is is uh giving me a glitch the website power of five life.com is that correct is in the episode notes right and if they put a slash gift they'll get a uh, uh an opportunity to select one of those um um recipe books or um my notes on living longer Awesome. Well, I'll make sure that that is also linked so that people don't have to hunt around because I know people are busy. I know you are busy, even though you are a retired geriatrician at this point. But everybody I've talked to that's retired says they don't know how they had time to work. So yeah, should probably well, I'm doing doing a podcast and talking to you is one of those things I love to do. Well, awesome. Um, I appreciate it. And look forward to maybe chatting again about other topics because I had a geriatrician we talked to somewhat regularly but she's very very busy and she's also in the uk so between the uk and california is a big time difference <laughs> yeah bad bad one yeah. i'm available to you uh jennifer anytime just let me know all right thank you Best to you thanks for inviting me fading memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts